So that's Orion as we see it. Look, now there's his belt, there's his sword, that's his shoulders. <coughs> we have a, uh, a star, a star uh, lecture going on. Good morning and welcome to our morning service. Um, this is the second of the weeks of um, the unexpected and extraordinary um, circumstances and the characters within those stories. Um, so we're looking at Esther this morning, but shall we just take a moment to pray? Father God, be with us as we worship you this morning. I do pray that your Holy Spirit moves amongst each one of us this morning and that we listen to what you want us to hear. Amen. Now, um, first of all, I'm going to show you, or Ian's going to show you, a picture of a trainer. Now, in our household, we see different colours. What colour do you see? Do you see, if you see um, sort of light greeny laces and a grey trainer, can you wave your hands or put your thumbs up? Okay. Put your hands down, thank you. Now, do you see white laces and a pink trainer? It's very, very interesting. As I said, in our household, we see different colors between us. So it's the same trainer, but different perspectives that we see. So that's why we're thinking about unexpected circumstances and how we deal with them this morning. But first, we're going to take a song of worship that talks about colours. Who put the colours in the rainbow? Who put the colours in the rainbow? Who put the salt into the sea? and some um, notices. Um, there was quite an extensive email from Catherine this week, but a couple of things to note. The church meeting is on the 19th of May. It is not the AGM, that's going to be in July. Um, the details of the Zoom and the times are on the email. Um, and it's Christian Aid Week starting from tomorrow, um, 10th to the 16th. So again, the details how you can donate are also on the email. Um, on the 23rd of May, that's Pentecost, we are hoping to do a Pentecost picnic. Um, we're able to meet in groups of 30. So if you were interested in meeting a group of 30 still socially distanced for um, maybe lunch or the afternoon, then can you let the office know and we'll know how many numbers that we're dealing with to where we can possibly meet in two or three groups. 
Um, and also there's a still a plea from the um, Zion Preschool Chair um, sort of committee. They still need a chairperson, really, really important group in the village. So if you're being stirred to um, talk to somebody about it, please see there's, again, there's an email on the um, notices. And uh, family news, the only news that I have is that Betty Hamlet um, is in hospital again following a fall. So Betty, do pray for her and her family. Um, and the theme for this morning is we're looking at the story of Esther. And she was a young Jewish woman um, whose family was taken when all the um, Israelites were taken uh, by the Babylonians into exile. And the Jews there, were, they weren't liked and they weren't popular and people tried to trap and, and get rid of them. Now at spring harvest this year, um, they worked with Open Doors about the secret church um, and gave us various stories about the secret church. And one of the things they said was, look around your house. What can you see that would mark you out as a Christian? So very quickly, have a look around the room that you are in and see if there are things that would mark you out or your family out as a Christian. So very, very quickly, have a scan around and see if there's things that would mark you out as a Christian. And if, if they're portable, you can hold them up or um, we can just see how many people have got stuff around their room. I see if you're holding something up. Oh, Ooh, hymns and psalms hymn book we've got in our yeah there's various song books there's a picture pack that's showing I think uh, there's another song book um what's Ellie you're holding up I can't across across sorry I can't see I'm a bit far away from the camera um all sorts of different things people are holding up. Steve's holding up a cross and a commentary. I think I recognise the commentary book. Um, Bibles. Cross and Bible in the Clark's house. Um, a rainbow from Leo, I think it was. in. Oh, oh Anna, sorry, Anna's a rainbow and a book that Zoe's got. So I, there are lots and lots of things that would mark us out as Christians. We're in our office and there's loads of stuff in this office that would mark us out as a Christian. Now, just imagine if you now had a knock at the door or ring at the door and it was the police coming to arrest you, because that's what happens in the um, persecuted church, that they are Christians and they are worshipping. And in some places, that isn't a good thing to do. And so just think about those people that have the same perspective. They, they want to worship just the same as we do, but their circumstances are different. And let's just say a prayer for those around the world that are persecuted. And Ian's going to put the prayer up on the screen. Lord, we pray for all those who are in unexpected and extraordinary circumstances. We pray for their safety when they meet to worship you. We pray for their peace when they meet to worship you. And we pray that they know we are standing with them when they meet to worship you. Amen. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together as we think about others across the world also saying this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And I'm just going to say another prayer for the um, young people that are going to be going out and all their leaders. Father God, be with our young people and all their lovely leaders as they go out to learn more about you. Bless them and keep them safe. Amen. 
And as the young people and leaders um, go to their breakout rooms, we're going to um, sing a song together. Now, this is a song about um, expectations where Jesus did the completely unexpected. Um, and the song is quite interesting because it starts off a very low, slow um, verse, and then the chorus really picks up quite unexpectedly. So um, we have the wonderful Salvation Army band um, playing the music for us. So if we sing along to this song, Low in the Grave. When, it's a bit silly, but like when, if we've got a blank piece of paper. What did we say about technology? Uh, Ian's just finding the clip for you. going to um, have uh, every month we try and have um, a, a different person talking about what they do uh, Monday to Friday or Monday to Sunday in their life and this week it was my pleasure to interview Tim Burgess. So welcome Tim thank you very much for um, being willing to be interviewed and would you like to tell us kind of what your kind of weeks are sort of for work? Yeah, so, um, part time I'm uh, sort of uh, working in a shoe shop, which I yeah I do occasionally in Christ practically. But um, the other thing I like to do is um, well I'm an illustrator as well. So um, and especially since being in lockdown and on furlough, I've basically been doing uh, illustration for the whole time and keeping quite busy, which is um, it's been really nice. It's been uh, quite uh, rewarding job and um so it that what i love about that is uh it varies through week to week um so at the moment i've got sort of two projects on the go i'm um 
well basically in the summer i um was very lucky enough to get my first work on start working on a first children's book which had just come out um called allotment fun and um for that i was just working loads on each page so you know on a monday i might start drawing the pages and i am um, i like to sketch them out first and then i ink them uh with inks and then i scan in the computer and um and then on another day i'll be coloring them in and so that's been really nice and so now i'm actually working on a second one which is really good so i'm um, really lucky to you know it's been going well so i've been very fortunate to be doing a second book now so is that the and same author or yeah same author her name's helen isaac she's um from elm park oh brilliant and, um, got connected where well, she was a teacher while i was at the elm park actually so that was lovely um and that was all thanks to kate heidi brown putting in a word so brilliant brilliant i don't suppose you've got a copy of the book to flash have you tim i do yes I go do. for it go for it and a shame and a shame plug and a shame plug is a plug there you go perfect uh, available on amazon there you go see so. Uh, so being very grateful so working on a second one now which is lovely um and then another and just another commission i've been doing is um started a music video where it's all animated for, yeah so um that's also great and yeah why lovers is just it can be so different each day uh, i don't really know what but you know you just get stuck into it and try and be adaptive so I've been very grateful and very fortunate. So what's been your favourite piece of um, illustration that you've done so far or drawing that you've done so far? Um, it might, yeah, well, to be honest, it is, it's a children's book. And um, Brilliant. I, that's why I really love is the illustration side more. And um, actually, well, because I've got the book here, it is the final page. Thought we end on a sort of uh, spoilers, but it's sort of a nice... <laughs> It's a nice um, double page spread of sort of a sunset with the whole allotment in it. Um, and so, yeah, I was, it's just really nice because I, I did that picture last in right. the cool order. So it was really rewarding to sort of, that's the final one. That's done. finished, yeah. I'll send it off and see how it does. So Brilliant, brilliant. So how does your um, faith impact what you do? Um, well, I think mostly it's being creative i think i mean you know god is probably the most creative thing imaginable creating yeah. a so actually i guess taking a bit from that and um really just seeing how creative he's been and knowing when sounds a bit silly but like when if i got a blank piece of paper and just being able to just create anything i like from my imagination and influences through god and just sort of um things I've learned and the people I've met and trying to uh, show that really, show my work through that. And um, it's been, yeah, so that's a huge impact. And the fact, I think, sort of all these kind words and um, support from people and God, I think, is just um, helped me move from a project to another project. Yeah. Another one, yeah. Another one. And um, I've been so grateful that I can do what I love. And um, really want to just try and do more of it so um brilliant so, yeah yeah but it's very very exciting and you've definitely been gifted given a gift so and it's, yeah. it's, it is a blessing to share it with others really basically yeah, is there exactly. anything specifically you want us as a congregation to pray for you um well i mean pray as a well firstly as a thanks just that i've been able to have these opportunities really but then also i guess secondly, um, I would love to do this more full time or be able to just do an art job full time and um, really just be able to sink into it and just because I love doing it when I can do it. And yeah. if, I'm, if I'm away from my desk or something working somewhere else, and I want to be back just trying to draw <laughs> or something like that. So um, pray that this can become more of a permanent yeah. role like, and I can really try and uh, just use it more. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Well, that's lovely, Tim, and I wish you all the best for all that you're doing and look with the bated breath for the next instalment in the book from um, from the lady from Elm Park. So well done. And it's been lovely talking to you. Thanks ever no so problem. much. Thank Cheers, you. then. Bye. Bye. OK, I think we'll just take the opportunity to pray for Tim now and then um, we will have the President's session. 
So Father God, I thank you for Tim. Thank you for his gratitude of the gift that you have given him. And I just really ask that you continue to bless him in all he does. And I really pray that he finds a permanent position or a role where he can really, really shine. So we thank you for him. And do forgive us, Lord, that we so often forget to say thank you. We so often forget to be grateful. And we so often forget you in our daily lives. So forgive us for all that we have done this last week that has not pleased you. Forgive us that we forget you, that we don't tell others about you, that you are not always the centre of our lives. And we know that you do forgive us if we are truthful and say it from our heart. So we thank you that we are forgiven. Open our eyes ever more and our ears ever wider each day that we walk in this, your world. Amen. And now Mel and Colin are going to um, share our prayers of intercession. I would like to start with a um... We'd like to start with a, um, a Bible reading. Uh, I urge then, first of all, the petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And that is, um, that was 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Father God, we continue to pray about the COVID-19 pandemic, in particular the dire situations in both India and Brazil. But we pray for other countries too, who still have very high infection rates and do not get high priority in the news. And these include our lovely fellow fellows in Nepal, Colombia, Kazakhstan, Bolivia, and the Philippines, and those are to name just but a few. We pray for their health systems, we pray for their doctors and nurses who are working so hard there. We hold up the people of these countries to you and pray that they may soon see the turning point and have hope that the situation will soon be brought under control. We pray for the work of Christian aid, especially during the coming Christian aid week, for the vital work that they undertake. This year particularly concentrating on our wonderful yet so fragile environment. We pray for all those who are working to raise funds in spite of the current restrictions. And as the restrictions are relaxed over the coming weeks and months, we pray for support and reassurance, especially for those who will struggle with going out again and mixing with others. May their confidence return as they see society adapting to a life post pandemic. We pray for all of those who have been newly elected this week. May they feel supported and enabled to carry out their roles with dignity and integrity whilst fulfilling the promises made. And we bring to you, Lord, those who are unwell or having difficulties at this time. Not only those mentioned in the family news, but those known to us personally, although they are, as always, encompassed by prayers from our wonderful Zion family. We also pray for those who have recently been bereaved. We know that your abundant love, as well as the support from family and friends, affords so much comfort. Lord, in your mercy, Hear Thank our prayers. You. Amen. Mel and Colin for sharing their prayers. Um, now we're going to um, watch a video from the Bible Project um, on Esther. It basically gives the story of Esther in a much better way than I could have done it. So here we are, the Bible Project on Esther. Esther. 
for the whole book. It begins, Haman's... It's not pausing. Um, well, yeah, we will get to it in a minute. There we go. The book of Esther, it's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. And the main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now, this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once, which might strike you as kind of odd. I mean, isn't the Bible about God? But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days, and it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses, and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant and wins. And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. Now, right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. So the focus now turns to Mordecai and Esther, who are the only hope for the Jewish people. They make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse the decree. But approaching the king without a royal request is, according to Persian law, an act worthy of death. So in a key statement, Mordecai, he's confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. And then Mordecai wonders aloud. He says, who knows? Maybe you've become queen for this very moment. Esther responds with bravery, and she purposes to go to the king with her amazing words, if I perish, I perish. Now, in what unfolds, we watch the ironic reversal of all of Haman's evil plans. So Esther hosts the king and Haman at a first banquet, and she says that she wants to make a special request of both of them at an exclusive banquet the following day. So Haman leaves the banquet totally drunk, and he sees Mordecai in the street. He fumes with anger, and he orders that a tall stake be built so that Mordecai can be impaled upon it in the morning. It seems like things can't get any worse for the Jews and for Mordecai, but all of a sudden, the story pivots. It just so happens that night 
the king, he can't sleep. And he has the royal chronicles read to him for good bedtime reading. And he just happens to hear about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. He had totally forgotten. So in the morning, Haman enters to request Mordecai's execution. And the king in that moment orders Haman to honor Mordecai publicly for saving his life. So now Haman has to lead Mordecai around the city on a royal horse, telling everyone to praise him. Now this moment in the story, it's a pivot for the whole book. It begins Haman's downfall and Mordecai's rise to power. Watch how this works. The day after is Esther's second banquet. So the king and Haman arrive and Esther informs the king that first of all she's Jewish and second that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her and to murder Mordecai who saved his life and to murder all of the Jews. Now the king's had a lot to drink so when he hears this news he goes into yet one more drunken rage, and he orders that Haman be impaled on the very stake he made for Mordecai. It's ironic and a grisly way for Haman to go. Haman's execution, however, doesn't solve the problem of the decree to kill all of the Jews. So the focus now turns to Esther and Mordecai as they make a plan to reverse the decree. They discover that the king can't revoke a decree that he's already made. So instead, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a counter decree. On the appointed day that all of the Jews were supposed to be killed, the 13th of Adar, now the Jews are ordered to defend themselves and to destroy any who plotted to kill them. Then Mordecai, Esther, and Jews everywhere hold banquets and feasts to celebrate this new decree, and Mordecai is elevated to a seat beside the king. Eventually, the decreed day comes, and the Jews triumph over their enemies. First, they destroy Haman's family, and then any other Persian officials who had joined in Haman's plot. And then on a second day, they get permission to destroy any who plotted against them throughout the entire kingdom. This results in joy and celebration as the Jews are rescued from annihilation. The story then tells about how Esther and Mordecai established by decree this annual two-day feast of Purim to commemorate their deliverance from destruction. And the name of the feast comes from Haman's dice. Remember, poor Im. The book concludes with a short epilogue as Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom and we are told now of his royal greatness and splendor as the Jews thrive in exile. Now, step back. Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal, right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end, they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center, you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation beautiful. Another fascinating feature of this book is the moral ambiguity of the characters. There's a lot of drinking and anger and sex and murder of which Mordecai and Esther are a part. Not to mention their violation of many commands in the Torah like marrying Gentiles or eating impure foods. And so the story is not putting Mordecai and Esther forward as moral example as if it endorses all of their behavior. But they are put forward as models of trust and hope when things get really bad. And so the book of Esther comes back to that question with which we begin, why God is not mentioned. The message of this book seems to be that when God seems absent, when his people are in exile, when they're unfaithful to the Torah, does this mean that God is done with Israel? Has God abandoned his promises? And the book of Esther says, no. It invites us to see that God can and does work in the real mess and moral ambiguity of human history, and he uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people to accomplish his purposes. And so the book of Esther asks us to be willing to trust God's providence even when we can't see it working, and to hope that no matter how bad things get, God is committed to redeeming his world. And that's what the book of Esther is all about. Now there was in the citadel of Susa, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, saying, son of Jar, son of Shimei, son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, amongst those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, 
who he had brought up because she had neither father or mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any other women and she had won his favour and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then Esther instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther, this Bible book is a little bit of a challenge. It's set in a culture that's quite different to our own and deals with issues that majority of us would have never had experience. And it's also a bit of a mystery, as Tim suggested in the Bible Project video. There's actually no mention of God in it. So what can we learn from a book that has no mention of actually God in it? The character of Esther is a very interesting one. From the Bible Project video, it mentioned that neither Mordecai or Esther were particularly moral characters and they broke many of the Torah laws. And that may be so. But if you look at the character of Esther and her circumstances, just like the picture of the trainers at the beginning of the service, you may see a different perspective. Helen Painter in her video on Esther paints quite a different picture. For her, Esther is a victim of trafficking and abuse and whose strongness in spirit and her faith in God draws her through the story. The King of Persia is depicted in a very negative way. He is a drunkard, weak and easily swayed. He sulks when his Queen Vashti refuses to present herself to him and all the others, he being very drunk at the time. And Helen Painter even suggests that there's implication that he requests that she comes naked. Now, she refuses and she is removed as Queen. Um, removed very, being a very mute word. It doesn't actually say what happened to her, but the implication that she was either banished or perhaps worse. Now, what happens next is, is shocking to us perhaps, but in the context of the time, it would have been quite normal. The king decrees that all women should have to respect their husbands as they are the ruler of the households. And it's a law that they have to. In this patriarchal society then, that was an expected response and sees the king trying to regain his credibility and position when his, which his, um, the wife obviously had undermined in front of everybody else by refusing to come to him. So now the king needs a new favorite, a new wife, and he sends out his attendants to bring him beautiful virgins that will be given a load of beauty treatments. I know it might sound like a bit of heaven for some of us, but what does it mean by bring the beautiful girls to him? Uh, would they have had a choice? Did Mordecai actually give up his own um, Esther, who was his legal guardian? We don't actually know. 
but I'm not sure that Esther would have run into the palace saying, yay, a year of free beauty treatment, here I come. There's nothing in the story after this that implies such vanity and shallowness. Again, it mentions further on that the girls were taken, which does imply a kind of passivity rather than an active reaction, but we don't know. Esther, later on in the story, does appear to have something special about her. Um, and people like her, like the leader of the harem. I did say we were kind of working in a very different culture. And the leader of the harem gives her extras. And she keeps her Jewishness secret. Jews were not popular in that time. So she keeps her Jewishness secret and she meets Mordecai, obviously also a Jew, in very secret, out of the way places so that nobody notices. Now, we mustn't forget that the reason the king wants the women, the virgins to go to the palace is because he wants a new favorite and a new wife. And in order to meet the king in person, each girl had to have 12 months of beauty treatment. 12 months, that's a lot of beauty treatment, but, and it's a massive but, then she had to sleep one night with him. And if he was pleased, then things would go well. So she is essentially trafficked, preened, and then presented as a prostitute to the king for one night. But there is something that the king likes about her, just like the head of the harem, and whatever that might be. And he, he favours her above all the others and crowns her as queen. But just like the Queen Vashti before her, the rule of the queen is at the whim of the king and she is not allowed to approach him unless he calls her. And if she does approach him without him calling her, she'll be put to death. Such is the society at that time. Now, a few plot twists later, it's a very um, complicated story as we saw from the video. Um, we come to chapter four where we find Mordecai asking Esther to go to the king to try and undo the decree, the law, that Haman, the baddie, had clearly manipulated the king to sign. I did say that he was a rather weak king. The decree that, because Haman didn't like Mordecai basically, decreed that all the Jews would be killed on a day in the future. They rolled dice, that's where you get the word which is the word dice, as it said in the video, um, and all the Jews would be killed. Mordecai knows that Esther could be killed by just approaching the king without a summons, but he asked her anyway, with the famous so often quoted line, and I'll read it, and who knows but that you have come to this royal possession for such a royal position for such a time as this. Who knows that you come to this royal position for such a time as this, he says. Now, most of us might have said, uh, no way, Jose, uh, you do want to do it. You go and do it, Mordecai. But Esther doesn't. She asked Mordecai to fast for three days and he and her and her ladies in attendant will also fast and pray for three days and then she will approach the king. And she faze, and says another famous line from this um, story. If I perish, I perish. Quite simply, if it means I die, then I die. Esther's words to me echo Jesus' cry at Gethsemane, where he asked the father to take the cup of suffering away from him. But then he resigns and says, not my will, but yours, offers his own will up to the will of his father. I pray that we all have a portion of that resolve that Esther and certainly Jesus showed. So even if her character is under question, she did some maybe not seen as moral things as far as the Jewish tradition was concerned, 
her willingness to stand up whatever the circumstances is noble. Would we have the conviction to be able to say or do that? Would we be prepared to meet in a secret church, knowing that if we got caught, we could be killed or our family killed, just like the um, stories of the secret church from Open Doors. That is the reality for some today. Many plot twist twists later, it is kind of like a melodramatic story. It all wells and finally ends well. Well, interestingly enough, Mordecai is elevated at the end of the book. And Esther isn't actually mentioned in the last chapter. It is still very much a patriarchal world that they lived in. So what does this strange other culture world tale mean for us with its melodramatic twists and turns, villains and heroes, heroines and strong, and for me, the strong character of Esther stands ahead above all the other characters particularly the male scheming characters in this story. Esther, though a victim, is prepared to do the unexpected and extraordinary. And the circumstances she has, she faces, have many different perspectives. But she appears to trust that whatever happens, happens, and even is prepared to die. But she doesn't do it without preparation three days of fasting and praying before she comes unsummoned to the king. So what can we learn from Esther? First, we must understand that though we may not feel God is present, he is working behind the scenes. And just because we can't feel him or see him doesn't mean he isn't there. This year has been very hard for all of us in so many different ways. And I too have had my moments of dark places. I was thinking about this the other day and I pictured myself some of the year in a dark room with the door firmly shut. That's where I was, where I was hiding, where I was staying, how I was feeling. And then in my picture, I felt I could start to attempt to open the door slightly and let in a chink of light. So I went to the door and I opened the door and peered round a little bit. And I expected to see Jesus standing behind the door because I had been talking to him during the year, but he wasn't there. And it upset me and concerned me. Why wasn't he there? Did he not care? But then I heard a voice behind me, inside the room. And this voice said to me, didn't you realise that the chair you were sitting on when you were in your dark room wasn't really a chair? It was me. And the when I talked to you, it wasn't coming from behind the door, the shut door, but it was from behind you. And didn't you realise that when you thought the wind was blowing your hair, it was me stroking your head. I never left you. In your dark room, I was there with you too. You were never alone. And I found that quite challenging and yet very comforting. We all know the famous footprints poem, but for me, the chair in the dark room that was Jesus is more personal to me. God is always there, especially when we can't see him. 
and if it helps you to remember that you are sitting on Jesus, then feel free to use my dark room picture to help you. Secondly, we are all faced with unexpected circumstances and how we react to them can define what happens next sometimes. We can rush in like a bull in a china shop and end up smashing things that we didn't mean to. Or we can take time to reflect, stop, pause, pray, and then act. Pray first, not last. Jesus always went off to pray quietly on his own before he had to do something important. If the Son of God has to do that, or had to do that, how much more should we? Thirdly, there are times when we will be victims, like perhaps not like Esther, but in different ways. And we must too decide how to react to that. There will be times that we are broken and battered. At Spring Harvest this year, Ian and I did the online version, which was actually really good. One of the speakers uh, was speaking about the verse that says that we will never be tested beyond that which we can endure. But he looked at it from a slightly different perspective, which I thought was really helpful. He explained that God knows us so well that when trials come, and they will, God is confident that we will endure. He knows how much we can cope with. So if you are being tested, tested hard, maybe like Esther was, it's because he can see how strong you are, not how weak. And I found that really challenging. So we are being tested not to show our limits, but rather to show how resilient and strong we actually are. And God knows that already. I thought that was a really interesting perspective on that verse. We're going to take um, some time to reflect on what God is saying to us through the story of Esther. And you can remember, God is with us all the time, even in our dark rooms or strange lands. We can choose how we react to our circumstances. And God sees us as strong in him, not weak. We are going to now listen to a song. It's from um, a television series called Keeping Faith, which Faith is the name of the character. Um, and it's a beautiful song that talks about somebody that is broken and bruised and battered, but still breathing, still there, still able to stand just about she is still breathing and some of us maybe need to realise that that's okay. To be just standing is okay. If we need to sit, we can sit on Jesus. But yeah, to listen to this song and then I'm going to lead us on a little bit of um, reflection in prayers, thinking about um, our circumstances, expectations, things that are worrying us. We're going to lay down and give back to Jesus. So just listen to this song and then we're going to have some prayer. Keeping faith. Give you all that you needed You cut but I'm bleeding And 
all of my strength I give to you I love completely You lose then you leave me And all of my hope I left with you too But I give my heart All I did I give my heart And although it's lost It is still beating My whole soul, I did. I give my soul, and although I'm broken, I am still breathing. I will sleep through the moment. All the moments you. Oh, for my love, I'll know the truth That I gave my heart all I did Shall we take some time in prayer? Lord Jesus, be with us all this morning. Be with those particularly that are bruised and broken through whatever circumstances they may be facing. Thank you that you never let a bruise re to snap that you put your loving hands around each one of us, whether we are sitting or whether we are standing or whether we are lying, you are with us. You have never left us. Help us to take that on board and to reach for your Holy Spirit to come in each one of us, to give us the deep joy that is there regardless of all our circumstances, the deep joy that knows that we are loved, that we love because you first loved us. And we do thank you that you see us as strong in you, you do not see us as weak, but strong and children and the family of yours. So be with each one of us as we face whatever comes this coming week, be it good or bad. You are with us and you love us. Amen. And we're going to finish our worship um, with a song. In Christ alone, all the circumstances are there, but in Christ alone, our hope is found. Whatever life throws at us, in Christ alone, our hope 
is found. Thank you, Ian. My hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease All in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. Oh, 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 oh. there in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth. Here in the power of Christ we stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me, you, everyone from his hand. Here in the power of Christ we stand. Um, just before we say the grace, just to remind you that there is prayer ministry for those um, that would wish it. There is, will be one prayer room today, but please let Ian know in the chat if you'd like to somebody to pray for you. And we have three lovely ladies that would love to do just that. Shall we say the grace together? Amen. Thank you, Sue and all.